This is the final video on Le Chatelier's principle where I'm going to discuss what happens when we have changes in temperature or changes in energy to a reaction. So first of all, you need to make sure that you're familiar with endothermic versus exothermic reactions, which we've discussed in the thermodynamics unit. So this reaction right here, um, you can see that heat is written on the product side. So that would mean that it is an exothermic reaction. Heat is produced in this reaction or heat is released in this reaction. And you should hopefully also remember that that would mean that the delta H value, the change in enthalpy, would be negative for this reaction. So that's why we um, discussed that extensively in the last unit because for different purposes, we're going to need to write the reaction in different ways. So in this slide, um, it says that an increase in temperature is going to uh, produce less products um, if in terms of an exothermic reaction, which that would describe this one. Uh, if it was an endothermic reaction, we would produce more products. And if we decrease the temperature, we're going to produce more products for an exothermic reaction. And if it was endothermic, it would be less products. Um, I think this is a really uh, difficult way to memorize this information. So even though temperature and heat are not the same thing, we're going to kind of treat it that way for Le Chatelier's principle and go back to the method, the teeter-totter method that we were able to use it for concentration for temperature. So remember for gases um, and changes in pressure and volume, we do not use the teeter-totter method. Okay, it's based on the total number of moles of gas on each side of the reaction. Whereas for temperature and concentration, we can use the teeter-totter method. Now in this class, we do not do any kind of calculations with the equilibrium, but I do want you to see what it looks, what the equilibrium expression looks like in case you do go on and take more chemistry classes. So you see KEQ here, and that's the equilibrium expression. Now the equilibrium expression is dependent on temperature. So typically we would look at a table that gives us um, the equilibrium constant, and it's based on you know maybe 25 degrees Celsius, something basic around room temperature. Uh, but changes in temperature will change what this number is. Okay, again, we're not doing calculations with it. I just want you to see what it looks like. Uh, this is the equilibrium expression for this reaction. So these brackets here, you should remember from solution chemistry that those represent concentration. So the concentration of hydrogen, the concentration of iodine, and hydrogen iodide. Now since there was a 2 right here, coefficient of 2, that becomes the superscript here. So it's HI squared. These are both 1. So I just want you to see what that looks like in case it comes up again in your life if you do take any further chemistry classes. Uh, however, uh, what I really want you to see right now is another method of doing this. So instead of memorizing your way through this, and I'm actually going to show a video that has a slightly different take on how to determine uh, equilibrium shifts for temperature. But uh, the way I'm going to do it is with the teeter-totter. So given this reaction right here, um, if we increase the temperature, I'm going to treat that um, heat right here as one of the products. So you can think about increasing temperature as adding heat. So I'd be adding to the products, which means we would shift to the left. Okay, and that makes sense because here it says if we increase the temperature for an exothermic reaction, we make less products. Well, if we are shifting the reaction to the left, we're making more reactants, right? We're shifting towards the reactants. Um, if we were to decrease the temperature, you can think about it as removing heat. So we would need to shift the reaction to the right, which means we're making more products, which is consistent here with the decrease in temperature, more products. But if the teeter-totter method is obviously a much easier way um, to get to the answer here. All 
All right, some more examples. How does an increase in temperature affect the concentration of the underlying substance? Let's just forget about KEQ for right now um, for the following reactions. So remember, I taught you guys how to determine which direction equilibrium is going to shift. And depending on which direction equilibrium is shifting, that's going to change the concentration of the reactants and the products. So if you do not remember how to do that, please refer to my second video that I created. So this question is asking us, how does an increase in temperature, so we're going to add heat. Um, first, we need to figure out which direction equilibrium is going to shift. And based on that, we could figure out what's going to happen to the concentration of this guy right here. So um, it gives us delta H is negative 82 kilojoules. Okay, so first of all, um, delta H isn't written as part of the reaction, so you need to write that as part of the reaction. So we know that an exothermic reaction, negative delta H, uh, means that heat is released from the reaction, so we can write it as a product. So if we are increasing temperature, think about it as adding heat. So the product side is getting heavier, so to speak, if you're thinking about the seesaw. Um, so if you add more heat, it's going to shift to the left. Okay, if it's shifting to the left, it's going this way. We're making more reactants, which means that everything on the, this side would be increasing, everything on this side would be decreasing. So again, we're shifting to the left. That means we're using this stuff up over here. Okay, so an increase in temperature will shift the reaction to the left and decrease the concentration. Again, that's what these brackets are. Brackets mean concentration of calcium hydroxide. And we're, we're just not going to concern ourselves with this for right now because we do not cover equilibrium expression in this class. Okay, so now we're looking at reaction B. Um, and you are given the delta H value. We want to know which direction equilibrium is going to shift. And based on that shift, what's going to happen to the concentration of sulfur dioxide. All right, so for an endothermic reaction, heat is absorbed. And I know that it's endothermic because delta H is positive. So it's absorbed in the reaction or it needs to go into the reaction. Endo sounds like in, exo sounds like exit. So heat would be written on the reactant side. So if we increase the temperature, you can think about um, for your teeter-totter that the left side would be getting heavier. So we would need to shift the reaction to the right. Okay, we're going to make more products to get rid of that extra um, weight on the reactant side. Okay, and if we're shifting to the right, that means everything on this side of the reaction would be increasing and everything on this side of the reaction would be decreasing. Again, the second video that I recorded um, goes a little bit more into detail about how you determine uh, what happens to the concentration when equilibrium shifts, but basically whichever direction it's shifting, everything on that side of the reaction is increasing, everything on the other side is decreasing. Okay, so if we're trying to counteract this change where we have too much going on in the reactants, we're gonna make more products. Okay, so that means the concentration of the products increases. And if we're increasing the concentration of products, that means that we would have to be using up the reactants. So it's pretty simple. Uh, this is just a quick little summary, and then I'm going to show you a video that explains uh, the changes to temperature in a different way. So whichever way you, method you feel more comfortable with, um, I'm fine with, as long as you know how to get to the correct answer. Um, okay, so a change in concentration does affect equilibrium, okay, and it would not affect the equilibrium constant. Uh, changes in pressure are going to affect equilibrium only for gas, uh, only if we have gases present. So um, we're only going to be looking at gases in terms of pressure and volume. Okay, that does not change the equilibrium constant, which again, we're not doing anything with it. I just want you to see this because you will see it again if you uh, take more advanced chemistry classes. Okay, volume does 
affect equilibrium, does not affect the equilibrium constant. Temperature does affect equilibrium and it does affect the equilibrium constant. So remember that for concentration, so changing the amounts of things, and for temperature, we could use the teeter-totter method. Okay, so you can go ahead and use a ruler, use your hand, use a pen to figure out which side of the reaction is quote unquote getting heavier or lighter um, to determine how it shifts. For pressure and volume, you're just going to count up the number of moles of gas on each side. You cannot use the teeter-totter method for pressure and volume. And we've done a lot of examples, so actually we'll go ahead and do this one as well. Okay, um, what happens to the concentration of hydrogen when pressure is increased? Okay, so we need to figure out how many moles of gas are on each side, okay? And I know that because it's asking about pressure. So I have one plus three is four moles of gas on the reactant side, and I have two moles of gas on the product side. Okay, notice all of these were gases. Gas, gas, gas. You only count the gases. Um, so if pressure is increased, Okay, when I'm under a lot of pressure, I want to be around less people. So that means that if pressure is increased, it's going to shift to the side with the fewest moles of gas. Okay, if you look back at your notes on pressure and volume, that's what it says. Increased pressure or decreased volume will shift to the side with the fewest moles of gas. So this side had four, this side has two, so it's going to shift to the right. Okay. Um, when we shift to the right, we're making more products. Therefore, the concentration of hydrogen would be decreasing. Okay, in order to make more products, we're going to use up the reactants. So the answer to this one would be decrease. Um, what happens to the concentration of ammonia when the temperature is decreased? Well, we have a value of negative 92.4 kilojoules for delta H. So that means that this is a exothermic reaction. So I'm going to go ahead and write heat on the product side. So if we are decreasing temperature, you can think about it as removing heat. So see that heat's on the right hand side of the reaction, so it's getting lighter over here. So that means that the reaction needs to shift to the right to reestablish equilibrium. So if it is shifting to the right, that means we're making more products. And if we're making more products, the concentration of ammonia, which is NH3, would be increasing. Okay, so if we're shifting to the right, everything on the right-hand side increases. Everything on the left would be decreasing. Um, what happens to concentration of hydrogen when nitrogen is removed from the system? So if we remove nitrogen, okay, see so yeah, that's on the reactive side, so the side gets lighter, React the reaction is going to need to shift to the left. Okay, and if it's shifting to the left, shifting in this direction, that means we're making more of the reactants. So hydrogen would increase. So real quick, there is a video of another way to look at heat. Again, you can use whichever method you're more comfortable with. In this lesson, you will learn about how a system at equilibrium responds to changes in temperature. Le Chatelier's principle states that a chemical system at equilibrium always works to restore equilibrium when it is stressed. To consider what happens to a system at equilibrium when temperature is changed, you must first consider the energetics of the reaction in question. If the forward reaction is exothermic, 
then the reverse reaction must be endothermic. Let's examine this hypothetical reaction where reactant A reacts with reactant B to produce product C and product D with a change in heat of minus 75 kilojoules. This means that when the forward reaction occurs, 75 kilojoules of energy is released and 75 kilojoules is absorbed when the reverse reaction occurs. So an increase in temperature would mean that the endothermic reaction would be favored to remove the excess heat, therefore counteracting the imposed stress. Decreasing the temperature would cause the system to produce more energy. Therefore, the exothermic reaction would be favored. The dimerization of nitrogen dioxide to high nitrogen tetroxide is an exothermic reaction. Nitrogen dioxide is a brown gas, whereas dinitrogen tetroxide is colorless. What observations do you think can be made when the temperature is decreased? How about when the temperature is increased? Please pause the lesson to think about this and resume once you are done. A decrease in temperature favors the exothermic reaction, so more dinitrogen tetroxide is produced. Since it is a colorless gas, the mixture should appear paler. An increase in temperature favors the endothermic reaction, so more nitrogen dioxide is produced. The mixture should therefore appear darker brown. Addition of a catalyst does not affect the position of equilibrium as it increases the rate of both the forward and reverse reactions. It only quickens the attainment of equilibrium. Let's return to the example of you digging a hole and your friend refilling it while you dig. Imagine that you are both given much larger shovels. The size of the hole still remains constant, but with each dig or fill, more soil is removed or filled. In conclusion, when the temperature of a system at equilibrium is increased, the endothermic reaction is favored. When the temperature of a system at equilibrium is decreased, the exothermic reaction is favored. Adding a catalyst has no effect on the position of equilibrium.